Every once in a while, something comes along that catches people by surprise. Maybe not a radical improvement, but generally a step in the right direction, all things considered. And then there's Castlevania on Netflix. Castlevania was one of the worst degradations of an anime in recent memory. The extended trailer that was Season 1 was fine, while Season 2 buckled a little under its own weight, but otherwise middling. Then Season 3 threw Castlevania down a flight of stairs at Olive Garden and beat it with frozen garlic bread before Season 4 staked it through the heart and left the bill. Now most of the previous group of morons has decided to piss on the ashes of what they already destroyed. With less than half the original team and a new cast of writers, most of whom with only one actual writing credit to their name, it makes sense that show would go as well as installing screen windows on a submarine. The previous series decided the multipath story of Castlevania III Dracula's Curse wasn't enough to stretch into a decent story and forced Curse of Darkness into the mix with ultimately disastrous results. Nocturne decides to one-up this effort by forcing features from Harmony of Dissonance, Rondo of Blood, Symphony of the Night, and Bloodlines into a blender, shredding it on max speed, and pouring in an unhealthy amount of Reddit and Tumblr. Castlevania Rectum follows Richter, the sixth canonical Belmont, because apparently Leon, Christopher, Joost, and Simon each did not have enough plot to make up a single straightforward story out of their adventures. Richter Belmont fled to France to be raised by his Aunt Tara and her daughter Maria, because his mom was killed by Olrox. Nine years later, during the French Revolution, a cabal of vampires believes their messiah, Urzabet Bathory, and her servant Drolta will save them by blotting out the sun without the need for Ariel's bow. As more vampires arrive and the tides turn, Twinker, Belmont, activist Maria, and Terra gain allies that help them, such as Edouard, a gay black opera singer raised in a French slave colony, and the bestest girlest boss ever's Annette. A runaway slave from the same slave colony of Saint Domaine with magical powers and can do no wrong. Noticing a pattern yet? And once again, there is a corrupt church and devil forge master, but this time the forge master has to use a giant machine to produce night creatures, so you know this series is totally different from the previous series. So now the Scooby gang comprised of a crybaby, a socialist, a perpetual victim, little Nas, and the only serious character in this show must defeat the union of the corrupt local church and vampires before it's too late. Let's start off simple with the animation. It sucks, even when the animation speed isn't slow like playing Perfect Dark on the Nintendo 64. Characters look like they're comprised of separate layers causing their faces to jumble in motion. Early on, Cardi B gives a speech about freedom, and while her eyes stay level with her brow line, her mouth shifts. And anytime these people walk or run, they either glide with no spring in their step or bounce with as much motion as a stuffed A cup. And let's not ignore the 3D shortcuts used when the budget ran out. Alcox looks for the Devil Forge Master's tome beneath the abbey and spots it on an altar that looks like it was rendered for mist on Macintosh. How about those awful skyboxes during the fight scenes? The fights are already bad enough, but this is hell of a boss level trash where you have close up 2D characters in the foreground backed by a skybox rotating with missing assets. Early on, Maria and Richter meet with revolutionaries in the woods, and there are rocks, bushes, the campfire, and oh yes, the people, but all of that disappears until the fight is over. Other objects will vanish too, like the vampire killer whip noticeably disappearing during Julia's fight with Bollocks, as well as the near entire fight under the Abbey. Then it appears in the beginning of the next episode, as well as the sword Richter dropped, but later in that same episode, in the pub, Richter's sword is now missing. Then before Just even had a chance to snatch the whip, it's already gone. Just is still sitting. How long did the animation team to have to work on this. It couldn't have been long because obvious mistakes like ball gags speaking with Megan V. Clydesdale is missing from the frame in this graveyard. Now for the writing. Those who wrote this travesty could pass a Down Syndrome test without studying. From the very beginning, characters make stupid choices even Steve-O would question. After All Rocks kills Julia, he decides to let Richter live. Why let the spawn of your hated enemy live to hunt you down later? No clue. Richter and Maria kill multiple vampires right out the gate, but no one decides to hunt them during the day and purge them from the city? The entire setting doesn't work. I refuse to believe all these revolutionaries who despise the ruling class would continue to willingly live in the shadow of both bureaucrats and vampires when they outnumber them 20 to 1, and with a Belmont in their midst. The French Revolution is literally the worst setting for a vampires are pulling all the strings story. If that isn't enough, there are litanies of inconsistencies that are never addressed. During his confrontation with Joost, Twinker says he knows all about his family's legacy, which is odd because he doesn't seem to know what a night creature is. I don't know what they were. 
I've never seen anything like them. How about Rihanna, sometimes required to say something before casting a spell when other times not? Even small details like vampires that can fly, and then they can't. And then they can. And then they can't. Not to mention, everybody lives or dies as the plot demands. Main characters survive moments of certain death like Twinker right before he finds his balls. He's captured by Drolta's posse, and instead of being mulched like the priest's son in From Dusk Till Dawn, he lives because monologuing. How about Beyonce confronting her former master, Valblanc? He tackles her to the ground, holding her throat in his hand, and instead of sparing us her gaslighting, he releases her to avoid an attack he could have prevented in the first place. Also, vampires and night creatures brush off the vampire killer like a fart in the wind unless the plot demands. Vampires are struck directly numerous times, and they just get knocked down for a brief moment. Drolta gets struck in the head and doesn't die like another vampire earlier in the series because she takes the whip to the face as well as Kamala Harris does dick. Oh, did I mention vampires can walk in sunlight now? Drolta and her minions must be using SPF 100K because they're totally fine in the middle of the day. Here's the OnlyFans model standing in direct sunlight and not a sizzle, but Vablanc combusts like a Vietnamese Buddhist. And it really is true, many LGB characters order overnight protection through Amazon to become... Sure, Juicy Smollier's plot armor might have been a little light, but he doesn't get hurt again for the rest of the series, and I can't help but think it's because he is gay and he is black, not just French. And his singing can reach the souls of other night creatures that never left their bodies for some reason, because it all must fall in line without valid reasons. This is why there are so many conveniences you could open up a store. Ulrox steals the Devil Forge Master book, but no one cares. Annette and Edouard just so happen to arrive at the right time to save Twinker, Goose Stepper, and Mama Bear before they're killed despite lacking the knowledge of their whereabouts. OnlyFans spots Maria walking away from Applewhite and instantly concludes, ah, she's his daughter. How? No idea, just like you don't get an explanation of Urzabet acquiring the blood of Sekhmet that turns her into a Thundercat. This is because there's no sincerity behind this project. Take Twinker's big moment where his latent magical powers reactivate. It's actually close to a good moment until he opens his mouth. There's something you forgot about Belmonts. <laughs> I was going to say something witty and cutting and brutal before I finished you off. But fuck it. Please, can we stop with the MCU dialogue and just enjoy something with consistency? Let me put it simply for the MCU seal clappers. Imagine if someone cracked a joke during Stark's death scene. If Rocket blurted out, Oh man, now who's gonna pay us? You would firebomb Marvel Studios for ruining the moment. And let's dive into the characters next, if you can even call these pod people that. Twinker is abused like Michael Vick's dog. Anytime he makes a suggestion, he's scolded and belittled like wanting a plan before entering the Abbey. I don't want a repeat of what happened at the Chateau. So you're afraid? I'm not afraid. I'm saying we need a plan. We have magic. Or three of us do. And he's gaslit when he gets defensive. Usually everyone says I'm too rash. The moment I say we need a plan, everyone stops calling me a coward. No one's calling you a coward, Richter. So you're afraid. And I'm hesitant to call him the predominant vampire hunter because he often gets bodied by everything around him since the whip is apparently useless. This is probably why he's saved by other characters like Alicia Keys and Alucard. And if it wasn't for the short time frame, Twinker's latent abilities wouldn't have activated for almost no good reason. Seriously, he thinks about his friends dying and that's enough for them to return. He never struggles enough to learn the lesson he never earned. Richter is basically a side character in his own story, and it's painfully obvious with the rest of the cast. Maria is a mixed bag of frustration as well. She's no longer a 12-year-old vampire-killing prodigy, but a 19-year-old anti-Christian revolutionary who believes capitulation is a binary choice between bending the knee to her ideology or suffering the guillotine. 
She belittles Twinker and takes charge as the short-sighted revolutionary, but then she's kind of sidelined by Mariah Carey. And this happens because her IQ drops faster than the value of Dogecoin. She learns the Abbot, who she's hated for so long, is her father and in league with the vampires. She has zero reason to care for this man, but decides to try and convince him anyway, resulting in her being captured. This is obviously so the overloaded story can rush to its current climax, but really? I wouldn't believe their relationship could be mended if you casted Cure 4 on it. The worst character of them all is Annette. She's the Amber from Invincible in this series. No longer an uplifting, normal woman captured by Dracula's forces, she is now a former slave from Saint Domain and somehow descendant of the African warrior god of metalwork, Ogun. If that doesn't speak to how high a pedestal she's put on, I don't know what does. She's treated like the second coming of Christ. First off, her backstory gets a near entire episode dedicated to it, which is longer than Twinker, Dumbass, and Terra's combined. When she seeks guidance or feels sad, she is coddled, told she can do no wrong, and to never give up hope. So you were freed? All we could do was retreat. None of this is your fault. What happened? He ran away. He ran the fuck away! The Balmond boy turned out to be useless as fuck. Learn to hear your ancestors. There is light in this darkness. Oh, you're back, are you? I knew you'd be back. I was more concerned than I wanted to be. The lion, the witch, and the audacity of this bitch. And it's in stark contrast to Zeus talking with Richter. More on that shortly. She even leads the charge into the church at the end. It gets worse, on top of also belittling Twinker, she almost refuses to accept responsibility for her actions. She's the reason Edouard dies, and yet when others fail, she treats them like shit. What happened? He ran away. He ran the fuck away! And let's not forget, she's an almost unstoppable warrior with near zero training. Her magic kicks in six months prior to the beginning of the present story, and she can bend earthen material like dirt, sand, and metal like Toph, as well as close wounds somehow. I got no idea how this one works, but she can cross-stitch bloodied cloth to close your wounds remotely. Oh, but wait, there's more. On top of expertise in combat and magic, she also has knowledge she shouldn't have. She was born and raised a slave, yet knows what night creatures are when the Belmont doesn't. I don't know what they were. I've never seen anything like them. They were night creatures. Demons. Made from human corpses grafted onto souls from hell. Weird, considering she doesn't know who Dracula is. Who's Dracula? She has the powers of Toph and Katara, the prowess of Ray Palpatine, and the attitude of Amber, along with the unlikability of Captain Marvel. Even the side characters are a gaggle of retards. Just Belmont rears his ugly head not as an uplifting figure with wisdom to pass down, but the Castlevanian equivalent of Luke Skywalker who shits in Twinker's soup. Evil will always win, Richter. Whatever it is, evil. And it's everywhere. It will always be stronger than us. On the other hand, Cecile is wise and encouraging, although she acts like Sub-Saharan Africans are the only people who've ever really suffered. Contextually, that makes sense, but I'll cover that in a moment. Ulrox is no longer a vampire magician who rules the upper half of Dracula's castle, but a gay Aztec who can turn into a belt with wings whenever he feels the need. He hates Urzabet, which is never really explained, though I wouldn't doubt if it's because he views her as a colonizer of sorts. Speaking of the devil in Prada, Urzabet is a complete ripoff of Carmilla from Vampire Hunter D. Bloodlust, complete with troll hair. She's supposed to be Hungarian, but is now Russian, for obvious reasons. And just about everyone else is completely unreal remarkable. Mizrak and Emmanuel don't need to exist, and Drolta is really only here because one of the artists surfs deviant art. Now, because this show's writers decided they want to stick their noses in things they obviously don't understand, allow me to explain how hilariously stupid both their points are in religion and culture. If they want to treat Christianity like 
like absolute crap, then it is only equal to talk about how absolute shit Sub-Saharan African and Aztec cultures were. First off, if Missy Elliott wants to disregard God, then you don't get to invoke his power. She's somehow a direct descendant of Ogun, yet can form and use a cross without a blessing. Not how that works, sweetheart. This is the same kind of bullshit wishy-wash use in the first series when the dead bishop was used to bless the river. Meanwhile, Ogun, who's just one spirit warrior among a pantheon is treated as though he's the monotheistic equivalent, complete with a beautiful heavenly background. Fuck off, you don't get to treat one like a Tinder date and the other one like a delicate flower. Now as for culture, because Aunt Jemima and All Rocks think their people are the only ones who have suffered, and exclusively at the hands of white people, allow me to oversimplify some history. First off, her bullshit claim that Europeans have never suffered like her people is obviously false with events like the Hundred Year War, the Roman occupation, and oh yeah, the Black Plague. Also, the Aztecs had an expansive empire because of their bloodthirsty wars and even more savage human sacrifices, averaging one every ten minutes. They killed around a hundred people a day, whether they were enslaved from a neighboring people or one of their own. The Aztecs were fucking insane until the conquistadors came along and made them stop. And how about the African slave trade that was started by Africans to benefit Africans? This is the same thing the Woman King tried to lie about, too. The African slave trade was the central pillar of the near entire continent's economy. So when Cecile tells Janet Jackson that her ancestors loved her, she specifies her mother and father, not the neighbors across the savannah that sold them for tobacco and gunpowder. No one's hands are clean of blood in history, and it's fucking infuriating when the truth is hidden or obscured for political and financial reasons. Well, Albilio, you've torn this perversion a new asshole like Billy Eichner sitting on an egg beater, but was there anything you liked? All right, in fairness, there are two things. First off, the remix of Divine Bloodlines is solid. The bass drum backed choir with complimentary electric guitar is fantastic. Second, the pixel art animation of Twinker at the end, because I'm not biased. Besides that, this show can slide down a pachinko machine lined with razor blades for all I care. Wokovania Nocturne, the Annette show, tells us what Konami thinks about one of their longest standing franchises. I'm not surprised this is the state of Castlevania either, but it saddens me that the Starbomb song was a better addition to Castlevania than either official show. After Resident Evil, The Witcher, Cowboy Bebop, and multiple other examples, of course this was going to devolve like the inner cities. Castlevania Woke Turn is an absolute disgrace to the franchise. It has zero respect for the people who made the series, the fans who love it, and it doesn't give enough of a shit about the political inserts to even get basic information correct. The the dialogue is laughably bad, the animation is terrible, the writing is some of the worst I've seen from Hollywood lately, and that says something. And this is only part one! In a year's time, I might have to endure this shit again, which would be like Mike Tyson punching me in the balls after he's already knocked me out. And you know Netflix doesn't care because money is money, and as long as that is all that drives them, you know that they are the real vampires. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Oh.